continue our Bible study on prophecy. One of the great things, because you're living in the end times before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're looking at America that you've never seen it like this before. It has disintegrated almost into the pits of hell with all the philosophy and everything else that is set forth. Who would have ever thought 30 years ago or 40 years ago that the Supreme Court of the United States is supposed to uphold the Constitution, Constitution and uh, protect the rights of the people, said it's all right, kill your baby now. If you don't want it, go ahead and kill it. You know, have it aborted. Kill it. You know, it's no use. No value on life after that. And you're seeing all kinds of things that happen. And then God said in the Old Testament, because he wanted to raise a nation, the nation of Israel, that would be a blessing to the world. And it would take the gospel. Because unto them were committed the oracles of God. They were to take it to the Gentiles and win all the Gentiles. And he didn't want it infiltrated with heathen worshipers and homosexuals and lesbians. He didn't want it infiltrated, so he said kill them. Because he knows what they will do to society. And if you're, unless you're blinded, you ought to see what homosexuals are doing in our society today. And it is absolutely filth. So, in fact, they had a man, uh, we've seen this, I forget the guy's name, we just seen it last night, on Ellen DeGeneres. And he had, uh, what was it, he was something, can't remember what it was now, but he had done something great. And I'll tell you what, if I'd ever been invited on her show, I'd have said, absolutely not, ma'am, but I'll tell you how to go to heaven when you die. Amen. Well, she wouldn't have invited me back, and I wouldn't have come in the first place. Now, what are you saying? Do you hate them? Absolutely not, because we've led homosexuals to the Lord. But if you don't want to trust Christ, I don't want to be associated with you, because I don't want my children to be associated with you, because spending a number of years on a police department, I know what homosexuals do, and they want your children so they can have a relationship with them, and they'll bring them up, and now we're so stupid that we will allow homosexuals to adopt children. There is no common sense in America anymore. It has evaporated. We're in the last times. Men will be lovers of their own self and so forth. I want to take a second. Thank David for getting this for me too here. And uh, let's show you where we're at. Okay. Now, if you ever try to do this without shaking, you know, so I hope you can follow that. If you see it following, okay, well, I'll try to do it a little better than that. But anyway, you just need and we take a run just through this real simple because God has laid out exactly from this time on exactly what's going to happen. First of all, the next event in this church age, 2,000 years, we're at the end. And the signs of the times are here. The next event, you're going to wake up in the morning and if you're not saved, your friends that are saved are going to be missing. You're not going to see them there. That opens the door here to... A seven-year tribulation period, seven years defined in the Bible in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 to 27. After the rapture, and this is what we're on this morning, right after the rapture, we have people missing like you would not believe. I mean, all over the world. There are Christians in China. We had a Chinese lady, a uh, young lady that was in our Bible college. She went back. In fact, if you didn't know this, I didn't know it till quite a while back. <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, she went back to win her people to the Lord in, in uh, China. Uh, the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor was a man that she met in an elevator over there. And uh, 
to make a long story short, she ended up and she married him. Led him to the Lord. He died of cancer after that, a few years after that. But he's in heaven today. That shows God can save anybody, can't they? But she led him to the Lord. The fellow who led the raid on Pearl Harbor. Can you believe that? But, anyway, there are Christians all over this world in various different countries and so forth like that. We had even Germany. We had, and we told you this many times because it was sort of a shock to me. We had two men to call. I wasn't there, Margie was. She took the call. They talked for about a half hour apiece. They were not at the same time. He had got our book on Martin Luther, the Master of Deceit, and he said, you know, he said, I've never read a book like this because we can't get a preacher in Germany to even stand up against Martin Luther. They're all scared to death. He said, I was a Lutheran all my life. And he said, somebody told me about Jesus Christ and I'm a Christian now. He said, I'm not trusting water baptism or anything else. I'm a Christian because I'm trusting Jesus Christ and his blood. His shed blood in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, not water baptism. That's a testimony called Claire from Germany on the telephone, talked for a half hour, and said, tell your husband thank you for writing that book. He said, that's one of the greatest books I've ever seen, Exposing Martin Luther. And it wasn't shortly after, I don't know how long it was, a couple of weeks or something, I forget now, had another call from Germany from another Lutheran who had been a Lutheran, trusted Christ as his Savior, and had read the book, and he said, thank you a million times over. We can't get a fundamental preacher to even stand up and say that because they're afraid of the persecution they're going to get from the people over here that have followed Martin Luther, you see. So this little church has an outreach like you have never dreamed in your life at all. It has that outreach. So much for that because we've got to get on to our Bible study. But I want to point out something else to Ken here. I guess things got three buttons on. i got to get the right button here. i got the right button. Okay. <laughs> Next comes... Russia. Russia is destroyed right after the rapture. Then we come on and this Antichrist government that's going to be a one world government that's going to be formulated here. You can't imagine the mess this world's in. You'll have surgeons that are Christians that have disappeared. You'll have heart specialists. You'll have family doctors. You'll have people in all sorts of our uh, society that have trusted Christ that won't be here. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they'll be gone. Now, this united, I should say, if I can put it this way, united uh, confederacy of people that are lost people now. There's nobody on this earth left but lost people. All the saved people left at the rapture. They're going to try to find, and the goal of the Antichrist is, is to set up a one world government that Satan can rule because he wants to take over what Jesus Christ has. So, you find out they'll form a one-world government league, but Russia and her five allies will not go along with it. <clears throat> They're not going along with this anti-government here and so forth. They're wanting to set up and you've got to follow them and do what they say and so forth like that. Russia will not do that. Neither will Libya, neither will Turkey, Germany, Iran, Ethiopia. None of those countries will go with Russia. Russia does not go with the Antichrist. Russia is anti-God. But they want to do their own thing. They're going after Israel. They've hated Israel all the time. All of these countries that we just named here hate Israel. And they want their country. Whether it be Muslims, there's going to be all kinds of uh, diversities of nationality and so forth. Hate Israel. Obama scares us to death because he's not really for Israel at all. And that's a scary situation because... God told Abraham, clear back, and has followed all through these 6,000 years, I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curse thee. We have invited the curse of God upon America with allowing the Supreme Court saying to any woman, you can kill your child that God created because of your immorality and your lack of, you ought to thank God, you ought to follow your mother, or you wouldn't be here. Amen? You won't even do that. So... We're in a mess, <clears throat> and we have all of this crammed down our throat, and we're supposed to accept it because some idiotic course of the Supreme Court gave that permission. Now, we come on in the middle, after three and a half years, the Antichrist stands up, and he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, so as God, 
he setteth in the temple declaring himself to be God. And he does that in the middle of the tribulation period. Then, Russia is destroyed here. That's what we're going to study. God destroys Russia, not the Antichrist. God destroys her, and you're going to see how he does it, which is an absolute masterpiece. The last three and a half years, you'll have to take the mark of the beast. If you miss the rapture, and you don't get saved in the first three and a half years, you will trust the Antichrist, and you will take the mark 666 on your hand or on your forehead, and your eternal destiny to hell is sealed. You will be there. At the end of that three and a half years, which is a total of seven years, you come down and God says, except I sort the, the uh, Antichrist seeks to kill every Jew he can, he made a covenant with him here and said, I'll give you perpetual peace. Because he's fooling with the whole world now, trying to get something together here. Hospitals are without all of your social services. If people are gone, it's going to be a total array, disarray like you've never seen in your life. Then, we find out, the best way not to fool with Israel is to make a covenant with them. Israel, I would say 95% of the Jews in Palestine today are atheists. They do not trust Christ as their Savior. We have Jewish evangelists, one of the greatest Jewish evangelists I ever met, and had the privilege to study on him in Bible college, was Dr. Mark G. Cameron. He had found seaside missions. He had won hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Jews to Christ down in Miami, Florida. Went up to Kissimmee, Florida, and uh, put the seaside missions up there, and that's where he later passed away, and he's on with the Lord now. One of the greatest Bible teachers I ever met. And knew him, we had him preach in our churches, a personal friend, and, <laughs> and so forth. I remember one time we were in Indiana, and uh, he, uh, we had invited him up, and I went down to get him off of the plane, but it wasn't until about 11 o'clock, or 12 o'clock, or something like that down there, in Cincinnati, or something like that, so I thought, I'd asked Doc, I said, uh, did you ever eat venison? No, no, no. I said, okay, I just wondered. So I went out that morning real early and had a good spot to go. So anyway, I got a deer. And, uh, but it was in season. But I got a deer <laughs> and uh, my bow. And uh, so I stood in the back of the trunk of the car. So I picked up Doc at the airport. And, and uh, I said, Doc, uh, would you like to try venison? Oh, man, I'd love it. I said, well, you're in good shape. I got him in the trunk. You got him in the trunk? What's he doing in the truck? I said, that's better than being in the woods, or you wouldn't be having any venison, you know. He said, well, when'd you get him? I said, I got him this morning early, right right almost at daybreak. And he was just thrilled to death. But one of the greatest Bible teachers I'd ever seen in my life. And I just thank God I had the privilege to know him, to be a personal friend of his, and to uh, just acquaint one of the great Bible teachers of the, of the past. And he was one of them. But anyway, you'll have to take the mark of the beast, 666, on your forehead or on the palm of your hand. And uh, then God said that intensity of all of the people that are with the Antichrist seeking to kill everybody, there'll be a one world religion, a one, uh, a one world government, and the persecution if you don't take the mark of the beast. In fact, if you want to mark this down, you can look it up in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. He showed John in the future what was going to take place. He said, I saw the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and refused to take the mark of the beast. And they were decapitated. So the guillotine will be, the Antichrist will be so vicious that if you refuse the mark of the beast, the guillotine will have you on display to the whole world and your head will be chopped off by the guillotine. This is what's coming. America has no idea. Our wishy-washy preachers anymore, you can't even get them to get the gospel straight, let alone preach on anything like this or anything else like that, because they don't study, they don't teach it in Bible colleges anymore, and everything is just to build a big church. Let's just get people to coming. That way we can take care of the preacher, huh? I guess. When Christ comes back, he's going to judge the nations. And when he judges the nations here, he's getting ready to set up the kingdom for a thousand years where there'll be absolute perfect peace. He had told him in Matthew chapter 24, and uh, there he said, two in the field shall be taken, one uh, taken, the other left. One taken to judgment, the other left is the saved, that go in, and all the millennium will start with all saved people. But they will have children. Not all of those children will trust Christ, just as you have today. You'll have Christian parents, but not all the, uh, the children will uh, trust the Lord as their Savior. They're brought up in schools to practically uh, deny the Bible, deny God and everything else and 
and all of this stuff you're hearing on when you hear uh, the commentators give the news and so forth, you'll hear them use, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God's everywhere anymore, and that is to train your child it's all right to cuss and use God's name in vain if you didn't know that. In fact, I called a radio station, uh, it's been about five years ago now, but I can do this once in a while, and some lady was, I forget what it was, but it had to do with dentistry, and she said, uh, oh my God, so I called the radio station, I said, what do you got, a bunch of atheists over here? And he got, so I want to get him stirred up a little bit, you know. No, no, what happened? Well, I said, uh, why don't you play the tape back there? Your lady that you got working for you and you're paying her, she's teaching kids how to use God's name in vain. But what does this represent to you? I, I said, are you an atheist? And I really got all these gays on there. No, no, but I'll check it out. I never heard that again. Never heard it. But, you know, uh, that may seem funny to you or whatever, but I'll tell you what, if you're going to do that, I like to shake them up a little bit. You know, if you're going to use God's name in vain, I don't want one of my children to listen to your damnable radio station and listen to, well, that's all right. Look, they did it. No, it's not all right. They shouldn't have done it. And they should clean their act up with their filthy, dirty mouth instead of putting this trash out over the radio. Now, it seems like a little thing, but your kids listen to it, folks. And when they hear it, they think, well, that's all right. He reigns for a thousand years. He has the Battle of Armageddon. He has an army of millions that come in there north of Jerusalem in the valley of Megiddo and that. And you find out that all of the armies of the world come against the Lord Jesus Christ. He kills them and he says in Revelation, he said their blood will be instantaneous so that their blood won't even have time to clot. Their blood will flow as deep as horses' bridles in the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is 180 miles long. You can't imagine this enormous battle that's going to take place. Then he sets the kingdom up for a thousand years, perfect reign. You're a Christian, you're going to be used of the Lord to take care of anybody that wants to commit murder or rape or anything. The angels and God will say, go down there and kill them. Right now, there will be none of that during the thousand year reign. It will be perfect peace. After that, those that are in Hades, where's Hades at here? Here we go, where's Hades at? You got to be under somewhere. Torment, here we go. There. You'll find out, he'll pull them up, and he'll have them at the great white throne judgment, and they will be judged and then cast into the lake of fire known as Gehenna for all eternity. Now, let's go back to where we're at, and let's look at Russia, okay? Because here God, 600 years before Christ was ever born, told you about Russia. If you have your uh, charts there that we had given out, then uh, you look on there on page 142, okay? And we're going to find out a little bit. And we'll start there where it says Russia will invade Israel on horseback. It's very interesting. And you'll find out in Ezekiel chapter 38 in verse 15. Are we on page 142? Okay. You got 142. Do you see Russia will invade Israel on horseback? Do you see that? Okay. Well, let's follow right on down. Well, as we quote in verse 15, Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses. Now this thing, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, has to do with the destroying of Russia and the protection of Israel. <clears throat> Soviet government for many years have been buying horses, and we wanted to bring this out later because you're not going to get this in the papers or anywhere else. They've been buying horses all over the world since the 30s and many, some before that. And uh, at a close of a public meeting, in 1934 it was reported that Russia owned 70% of all of the horse flesh in the world. There's a reason for that. Now, at, and we quoted some things that, uh, of men that have been there and so forth there. At the close of a public meeting, a man stated the following. He said, I know, and this had been speaking, a man speaking on Bible prophecy, and I quote, I know that your statement about Russia's horses is correct. I'm a buyer of horses, and at every important horse sale in this country, the, re the representatives of the Soviet government are present. They're there. They keep track of them all, and they send their men there. They buy light and fast horses, which they declare are to pull plows of Russia, but they're buying the wrong kind of horses for agricultural purposes. They're not buying it for that. They're buying it for welfare, I should, uh, warfare, I should say, purposes. And there's a reason for that. 
1968, a Jewish Christian evangelist was speaking on prophecy concerning Russia and its forces, as is stated in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, verses 4, and uh, verse 14 and 15. He was interrupted by a man who wished to make a comment, and he allowed him to do it. Here was his <coughs> comment, all right? He said, and I quote, I was a missionary in South America. While studying at a hotel in Uruguay, I made the acquaintance of a fellow guest who was a Russian. When I asked him what he was doing in South America, he replied that he was buying horses for the <coughs> Soviet government. And I asked him, what kind of horses are you buying? Are you buying heavy horses for agricultural work? And he said, no, was his frank reply. And he said, I'm buying light and fast horses for military purposes. Now, to understand, and you never hear this in your newspapers, they don't report this, but even America and Afghanistan has used horses and mules quite a bit, but you'll never find this uh, in your newspapers or anything else. Now, as you continue on, you find out that when they come down on horses here, and you can read, we put other things in, we're not going to give all of that to you because we're going to have it in our book when we finish it on Bible prophecy, but if you'll notice in Ezekiel chapter 38 in verse 22, we're going to find out what God says. He says, and I will plead against him, that's Russia and her allies, with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him, and that word rain, just keep that in mind, upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain. Now the two rains are different Hebrew words, and there's a reason for it. And great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. We're going to study that just a little bit. But the Hebrew for the general rain is matar, M-A-T-A-R, and that's the first rain here. In other words, when they come with all of their horses down through all these valleys and mountains and so forth, and I want you to look because I think that uh, this will give you an idea And once you see this. So we put this big map up here, and what it does, if you'll notice, that uh, all of these Jerusalem, when they come against Jerusalem, you're not just, <laughs> you're not just coming uh, down the plains and the prairies. You're coming through all of these, Mount Moriah, Mount Tabor, all of these mountains here completely surround Jerusalem. Here's Jerusalem where the star is. Here are all of these countries that are coming with the exception, and we'll get to this a little bit later about Germany, because Germany is clear up here, clear up here past Italy, and it's in the northwest corner. And when God says, and I just say this, when they come down through here, all of these mountains, in fact, this whole mountain range runs clear from up here to the, from north of the Sea of Galilee, clear, clear on down here past the northern part of the Dead Sea. Now, Russia has to come through all of these mountains, all of these mountains here, and in these mountains are mountains and valleys, deep valleys. No way a tank could do this. I mean, you, you, you just couldn't do it. You have to have horses and mules to do this. That's why God said... They'll be coming on horses. Plus the fact, radar cannot pick them up, you see. Because all of this coming through here, and this is why God says, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to destroy them. And it's very interesting. So let's see how God says he's going to destroy them. All right. The second rain, where it says down here, overflowing rain, that is Geshem, G-E-S-H-E-M. And that word is different. It's from a root word, and it's pronounced shotoff, and it means to rain violently, overflowing, to gush down, overflow, and wash away. In other words, God says, when you're coming down through these, I'm going to start a rain. It's going to start to rain. And then as you get a little further and a little further, I'm going to really let it pour down that even your horses can't get through. No horse can go up these mountains here, even with their sure-footedness, if it's so sliding on mud and, and wet grass. They just can't do it. Tanks can't do it. God says they'll come on horses, and Russia came on horses for a reason. Number one, didn't want the Antichrist to know, and with the radar, about tanks coming down, there'd be a conflict there. Russia just wanted to, she always wanted to control the world by herself. The world was in total disarray with all the Christians disappearing, and we're in a mess. We're in a mess. Now, let me just point this out real fast. Since America is mentioned nowhere in the Bible at all, 
if she can stay out of the war with Russia, who's going to be existing after the rapture, because that's when she's destroyed, America's nowhere mentioned, unless she's with the other nations, who will go along with the Antichrist? And that's what America's headed for right now. If you don't know it, I'll just say it, it's exactly what Obama wants. That's why he's taking away your liberty by this move and that move and this, why I'm not going to Congress, goes ahead and passes things and so forth. <clears throat> Which, if the other side gets in, they say they're going to repeal everything that he has passed. Well, I hope they do, but it doesn't make any difference. All of that, we are so far gone, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. <clears throat> We are on the last days with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It could be tonight. If you wake up in the morning and you're not saved and your children are gone, then you know the rapture took place. And you better trust Christ right then because you only have three and a half years to do it. Because if you don't do it after three and a half years and seeing the rapture and all these people disappear and you've been in church, you've listened to this, you know it's true, you can look in your Bible, it's right there, then you will still reject Christ and trust the Antichrist because... He promises you peace. And that's exactly what Israel will trust. Peace. They've always wanted peace. And here this man will stand up. He is the great orator. And I'll just say this for Obama. He's a fantastic orator. I mean, he could convince you. He could sell a snowball to a, 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 a what do you call it? <laughs> An Eskimo. He could do that. I mean, this guy's convincing. He gets up there and speaks. He speaks with all kind of authority and everything else. But what you don't know is he has a whole system behind him. He's just the spokesman for a whole system behind him that wants to control this world under a one world government. And that's why these things are being done right in front of your eyes. You know. So, they come down there and let's look on down. He says, I am going to plead against him with pestilence and blood, and I will rain upon him and his bands upon many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. We're going to examine that just a little bit, because if that rain comes down, it's going to make it absolutely impossible, because God is not going to allow Russian or five uh, satellites to harm his city and his people. He is not going to do that. So he's going to destroy them. The Antichrist has nothing to do with it. So, anyway, the first appearance of rain in this verse, the general rain, the second rain describes the general rain, will turn into a violent rain, drowning everything. Rivers, streams, ponds, lakes will be overflowing. God knows what he's doing uh, with the weather, so that armored tanks would be bogged down due to the mud caused by the rain. And a person must remember looking at the terrain surrounding Jerusalem, and that's why we have this map up here for you to see. It is completely mountainous everywhere deep valleys in between those mountains and so forth like that but it's everywhere you see so they come down there and anyway uh they couldn't be picked up by radar god designed this in the bible 2700 years ago in, in ezekiel chapter 38 in verse 4 very interesting now we go on and look and i just want to say this we find out if we go on here and look in verse 4 i will turn them back I'll put hooks into thy jaws, that's on your next page, 144, and I will bring these forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Let me just say this. Uh, you know how easy it is to get a splinter in your finger. You can take uh, olive oak or any hardwood, and you can take and you can make a sword, and put it thin enough, it won't break, and put it down to a point, and it'll kill a person just as fast as a metal sword will. It's devastating. Now, all of that is very important, because later on you're going to see, God says to Israel, after Russia and her allies are destroyed, it'll take you seven years to bury, or to burn all of the instruments there. In fact, in burning them, you won't have the other people outside of Jerusalem, you won't have to cut down wood in the wintertime anymore because there'll be enough wood from these armies that come down, hundreds and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers with all of their wood instruments. All of their shields will be made out of wood and so forth, the finest, just like they did in the Roman time and back in the Medo-Persian and so forth, and the Babylonian time and all of that, that kind of warfare. That's what they're coming down with. Amazing, isn't it? 
And here's the amazing thing, that we have people so stupid and ignorant that you don't believe the Bible when the history of the world is already prophesied here, even to include what kind of weapons that Russia and Libya and her five allies have hundreds of years. This was written 600 years before Jesus Christ was ever born. This is 2010, we'll say 600 or 26, almost 2700 years. 2700 years ago, God said, Ezekiel, write this down, is for the time to come. He wrote it down in Daniel, which is a companion of the book of Revelation. And Daniel said, Lord, I don't know what, what he says, not for your time, Daniel. It's sealed until the time of the end. Then they'll begin to understand as time marches down through history. And you start studying your history and you see what God has written. You see, aren't you glad, let me just say this, aren't you glad you're a Christian? Aren't you glad that you know you're going to heaven when you die? And Jesus Christ made it so simple that anybody can understand. A little child can understand. He said, I love the world. I gave my only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And your whole time's dated from that. What is it, 2010, 2011, 2012? Right on up as it goes as we have time continuing. A.D. That's after death. That's the Latin for Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So your whole time, it wasn't named after Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, all the great philosophers. <coughs> it was named after Jesus Christ, whom the world crucified. He came unto his own Israel, his own received him not. They had religion, but they didn't have Christ. They didn't want him because he interfered with their religion, that they were making money off of the people, and he drove them out of the temple three times. He said, my temple is a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves, you bunch of crooks, you bunch of priests. They come in with their animal sacrifices. You charge them ten times what they are supposed to be worth. You've made a fortune off of these people that have to travel miles because they couldn't bring the animals with them. And then you buy them here. You sell them to the people ten times more than what they're worth. That's what Christ dealt with. What do you think people think of him today? Do they have an excuse every time they sign a check, every time they put down a date for anything or sign a document or anything else? They attest to the fact that Jesus Christ was here because they have to put A.D. They wouldn't put B.C., would they? No. Very interesting, isn't it? I think God's put the proof here. Now, let's look on down. <clears throat> we go again, and if you look in verse 15, again in verse 15, And thou shalt come from out of that place of the north parts. In fact, we'll point this out just as for emphasis place. This is on page 144. And uh, the north place is very simply this. And we pointed this out to begin, but I'm just doing this to refresh your memory. When he says the north, and knowing that's Russia by the name and so forth, Meshach and Tubal, Meshach, present-day Moscow, and Tubal, present-day Kabalsk on the eastern side of it, capital and so forth. But you take your map and you look from Moscow right straight down, and you'll find the line. It's almost right straight down north of Jerusalem, which is the center of the world, biblically speaking, here. When they use biblical language, it's always north of Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem, east of Jerusalem, west of Jerusalem, and so forth, biblically speaking. So when Ezekiel wrote this out of the north parts, you just trace your line down from Moscow, right straight down, you'll see it's almost directly north of Jerusalem. I think God knew what he was talking about when he had Ezekiel write this, didn't you? If you had to put east, it would have been wrong. If you put west, it would have been wrong. If you put south, it would have been wrong. He had to put north to make it right. So, out of four options, he had the right one. That's pretty good, isn't it? Ah, maybe it's just by choice. Who knows? Okay, let's go on down. Now, let me just read you a couple of things here that took place. In Afghanistan campaign, the United States Army Special Force soldiers thundered across the plains on horseback. You didn't know that. How many of you knew that? Some. How many didn't know it? Truthfully. You didn't get it in the papers. Maybe you went over there and visited. See them riding them horses. But anyway, and they had mules in Afghanistan today. And they have a field manual on the subject entitled FM 31-27. They also use pack animals in support and so forth. 
As events in Afghanistan have recently shown, there is a place in modern warfare for animal transport of goods and personnel. Horses, mules, and donkeys have played a much larger role in guerrilla warfare than has been appreciated in the literature on the subject. Those you don't read it in the papers, do you? Anybody read it in the Star Tribune? I don't think so. How about the uh, 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 up in Marshall, the Independent? How about in Walnut Grove paper? No, I don't know. No, no, I won't say more about that, but uh, not in the Walnut Grove paper, okay? Now, let's call your attention. Let's go over here to your next page here. Let's go over to uh, page 145, and you'll have this if you want to follow along there. And uh, let me call your attention back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 in verse 9. Notice what it says again. Thou shalt ascend and come up like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, and thou and all of thy bands and many people with thee. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 9. Now the Hebrew, and we brought this out a little bit to give you a little more description here of what takes place. The Hebrew for ascend is Allah, and it's pronounced Allah, A-W-L-A-W, -A -A that's the way it's pronounced, has various meanings figuratively and literally. For example, it means bring up, rise up, ascend, come up, lift yourself up, mount up, rise up, shoot forth, and spring up, and so forth. So it depends upon the context of how it's used. Now, many commentaries, when you're reading commentaries on Bible prophecy, they apply this to helicopters and aircraft. And this is their opinion. But this is not what the Bible teaches. It's not helicopters, and it's not airplanes. It's horses. So let's see how it's used when we come here to the context here. You see, so let's look at that a little bit. We look at the map, and again, just get your mind fixed. Mountains everywhere. This is not like going over uh, a small little hill or something like that, or the Badlands of South Dakota and some of those hills out there. These are mountains. These are steep mountains. Now, you have, for example, mountains everywhere. Now, Let's begin to look here. Uh, Russia's going to attack. It's going to be on horseback. Let me give you one more thing, and I want to go back here a little bit, because one of the great Bible teachers of the past here, and I wish he was still alive today. I just missed him down in Bible college. He was scheduled to speak down there, and that's the late Dr. M. R. D. Hahn, and a great prophecy teacher. But he founded a radio Bible class in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and was on all over the world with his Bible teaching. He was a great Bible teacher. But when it comes to Bible prophecy, very, very good, very excellent on Bible prophecy. He was one of the two books I read that I thought, dear God, if you can ever give me a gift to make the Bible simple, I don't care about anything else, give me, I want you to do that. Because the simplicity that he used greatly influenced me so much that I thought, why aren't Bible teachers doing this? I mean, it's so simple. It just takes a little bit of a study. And I said, Dear Lord, please give that to me. Because this is what really encouraged me. And he was a great Bible teacher. But anyway, here's what he said concerning this. M. Marty Hahn, a great Bible scholar and Bible prophecy, in his writing concerning Ezekiel 38 and horses used by Russia to invade Israel, which was written in 1951, here's what he states. He states, and now, right while we are reading in Ezekiel 38, this is his words in 1951, in Ezekiel 38 about Russia's horses, my daily newspaper comes out with the information that one of our military leaders has been under severe criticism in Korea for allowing 5,000 mounted communist horsemen to cross the Yulo River against our forces without even being detected by our observers and reconnaissance planes, very interesting indeed, even though it is tragic in light of God's word. This thing, you never heard anything about that, did you? Put it back there, back in 1951, Korea. Now, we come on down and find out in Ezekiel 38.10, of all the nations of the world, one may wonder why God has chosen Russia to be the leader of five other nations in an attempt to destroy God's people and the nation of Israel. In Ezekiel 38.10 is part of the answer. 
And he says here, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. That's very interesting. Have we any proof of that? Yeah, I think we do a little bit. Evil thoughts come from the evil one that Satan Russia in the past has continued to the present to continue to deny God. It hates Christians. It uh, is a godless country, along with the other countries that we've listed that will be her allies. They have false gods, but Russia doesn't really have a god. Russia is just godless. They just want to control the world. They want to be the ruler, and so forth like that. But we're going to find out as they come on down there, and God is going to destroy them all, it just sort of fulfills, and it's sort of a general principle in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 says this, God is not mocked, for whatsoever you sow, you're also going to reap. And how true that is, and that's exactly what Russia is going to reap, you know. And, uh, but you just can't do that, and uh, uh, go against God's people and do it. Then we put in here, and let me uh, come on down. You can go to page 148 and come halfway down. We're not going to talk about safari and, uh, and, and that. Uh, that We just use that as an illustration there for uh, Russia. How that they lied about and against God, and God destroyed both of them, Ananias and safari, in Acts chapter uh, uh, 5 and so forth. Or Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. But let's go on down here to verses 9 and, or in verse uh, uh, where... We want to bring out about Robert F. Kennedy, and when he went in 1955, this is concerning Russia now. A lot of people don't know anything about it. Yes, we know they don't like Christianity and so forth like that, but they're a godless nation. They are the God themselves. Robert F. Kennedy, in the Council for uh, Senate Investigations Committee, reported following his visit to Russia in 1955. He went there. This was reported in U.S. News and World Report for October the 21st in 1955, and they covered it. He said, and I quote, this is a quote from him, in Leningrad they have a museum which is devoted completely to ridiculing God and people's religious beliefs. For instance, when you enter the building there, sitting on top of the cross, wearing a top hat, smoking a cigar, and portrayed as a capitalist, while a working man is bent over and carrying the cross of him, that is, of Christ. The leadership minds of the Russians are so diabolical and sick mentally with the fever of anti-Godism that it even has implications beyond the scientific and military achievements and so forth. Now, Time Magazine quotes from a Russian magazine the last verse of a poem which indicates that creation from the communist point of view, as under new management. And here's what it says. And here we have our Sputnik. No secrets, the newborn planet, is modest about its size, but this symbol of intellect and light is made by us, and not by God of the Old Testament. And you can see they are anti-God of creation or anything else there, you see. Now, Coming on down here, Russia's strategy for invading Israel, as we've already said there, the last seven words of Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 10 says this, And thou, Russia, shalt think an evil thought. <clears throat> Verses 11 and 12 of Ezekiel 38 describes their aspirations, which are nothing but evil. And here's what it says, here's what God says in the Bible about them. He says, And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, and I'll go to them that are at rest, and that dwell safely, all of them, dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, and to take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. In other words, they're going to a land, when this takes place, the rapture takes place, Israel will have no cities that have fortified walls around it in order for their protection as they used to have. They will have no weapons. Why will they have no weapons? Because they believe the Antichrist. And when he makes a covenant with the nation of Israel and promises them peace, we will protect you. This United Nations of atheists and ungodly men, they're all lost, but... 
they have a society to fool with all over the world of countries where people have disappeared. Now you got a problem. We have a problem uh, finding a senator who's died or uh, has got caught doing something he shouldn't, he gets out of the business. Well, who are we going to get? We got to go through all of this. Should we elect him or should his uh, son take his place if he's the governor? Or what should we do and all this kind of stuff? Can you imagine? This is all over the world, folks. Major things, if you're taking a train, engineers are missing. Maybe the one that runs the, uh, uh, the station, he's missing. All the computers, the guy that runs the computers for this, they're missing. And you got this all over. They don't have time to fool with the little nation of Israel, but they make a promise through this united board of men that are trying to bring it all together, contacts Israel and says, look, look, we got a lot to do. We promise you, get, you're in your land, we will protect you. You don't have a thing to worry about or anything else. And just do this, because to have world peace, we got to do like America wants you to do. What does it want you to do? Turn in your guns. You're not supposed to have guns. Really? You're not supposed to have them. That, that, that's why we have so many murders and everything else out there. You stupid idiots, and I'm saying this to them. The guy that robs a place with a gun, automatically 10 years in prison, there is no probation. There is no slappy handsy, handsy, handsy because, oh, I did that, I made a mistake, and my daddy, uh, you know, he, he molested me when I was young and all of that. No, 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 no. You had a gun, sir. Ten years in prison, and that is it. There is no parole. You don't get out for good behavior. In fact, you're there, and you better behave, or we're going to add more years on to it. Amen? That's how you handle these misfits out here with guns. And you people that don't have a record and you're law-abiding citizens, carry a gun anytime you want to carry it. We're not worried about you, but America, to control you, let's get rid of all of these guns. We already got them now that, uh, you know, you got to take a test. I had to take a test. I had to go up and do this. And then I sit there and listen to this idiot for two hours talk about how you break a gun down and so forth. Now, what's the name of this part and all this kind of stuff? And I thought... You know what, I'll tell you what, this is an absolute insult to a person that has any common sense. If any of you had to get a gun permit or you want to get one, maybe you get one to carry a pistol or there where a concealed weapon, you don't have to have it concealed. Nobody? You and I'm the only one? Good night! I'm going to be labeled as a killer because I have a right to carry a pistol. I shouldn't even have to pay $100 in order to carry a pistol. Why, why are you charging me? The Constitution gives me a right to do it. All of this is being taken away from you, and that's why America will go right with the Antichrist here. We want a one world peace, and let's take all the guns. Israel lays down all of her arms and everything else, turns them over to the Antichrist, because they believe that this new world government is going to protect them. After three and a half years, he breaks that and seeks to kill every Jew he can get his hands on. What do you think that America will do to you? Why not take the guns away from the criminals? The only reason I'm even bringing that up is, can't you see the signs of the time that you're in in America today? Can't, can't you see the signs of the times? I mean, we want to control you. We want to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. We want to tell you, you have to buy insurance. And if you can't afford to buy insurance, we're going to fine you. Well, that's about as dumb as you can get. Why are you going to find me? I didn't have enough money to buy in church. Now I've got to pay a fine with no money I didn't have to buy the insurance. You dumb suckers, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, you idiots? I wish you'd elect people like me and everyday citizens that didn't really have a college education and all of this, but they had common sense, which we can't find in our government or anything else. No common sense. How common sense does it take to make. Israel, if you would look in your Bible, God is telling you what you're doing is wrong. He's exposing you're following the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ, who you rejected for years and years and years, you see. Boy, I'll tell you, without the Bible, we don't have a chance, do we? We really don't. And our time's gone. This is a, probably here a good place to uh, stop here, and uh, I think we'll do that.
We'll stop here on page 49 on your notes there, and we'll pick it up next week. I gotta mark it because I forget where I stopped if I don't mark it. You know, <laughs> okay. But uh, anyway, there is a very important thing we're gonna stop with here, and that is this. The most important thing in your life and the most important decision you'll make is not whether you're going to have a big funeral or be cremated or what insurance company that you're going to go with when you get your insurance. That's not half as important as is to what think ye of Christ. Are you going to follow a religion? Are you going to follow when the preacher gets up there and says, I can forgive your sins because I'm an ordained minister of God. He's the biggest liar right straight out of hell. He can't even forgive his own, but he's going to tell you he can forgive yours. Really? That doesn't take much common sense. Unless you ask him, who forgave your sir? Well, who, who, if he does say Jesus Christ, say, why don't you recommend him? Why are you taking it upon you in order to say you can do what Christ can do when you can't do what Christ can do? Why are you standing up and saying, I'll forgive your sins? That applies for the priest too, or anybody else, whatever you want to call yourself. But whatever you call yourself, I'll tell you what I call you, you're funnier than a $3 bill. You're lying. You're an outright two-faced liar because my Bible says only Christ can forgive your sins. Only God can forgive your sins. And if you can say you can forgive your sins, and I want to put you to the test just like God did, okay, which is easier to say, I'll forgive your sins or rise up and walk? Now, if you can forgive sins like Christ, you can heal the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse the leper, right? That's what Christ did. So you come to me with the hospital. In fact, you don't have to go there. I got diabetes. I want you to heal it right now. Amen. If you can say, I can forgive your sins, Max Shouts, heal me of my diabetes. My wife has Parkinson's. I want her healed. Boom, right now. And if you can't do it, your phone here at a $3 bill. I don't even want to see your pukey face again. And least of all, come and support your church. What in the world are you talking about? It's my money. It's my life. And you can't forgive my sins, sir, and I'm going to trust Jesus Christ who died on that cross, paid for my sins, and I illustrate it this way, and then we'll close this morning. We'll pick it up, because this gets very interesting as we go on here. Very, very interesting. Bill Fold, sin, I'm the sinner. Max Shouts, don't go to hell and pay for your sins, please. And don't believe this stupid preacher, lying preacher, that says, I can forgive your sins. He can't even forgive his own, so throw him in the basket of somewhere. I throw him in a waste paper basket. This hand represents Christ. All right. God said, I've sent my son, Jesus Christ, no sin. He loved you. He left the glories of heaven to come to the hell on earth and go to the hell of the cross to pay for your sins, Max Jones, so that he could have you live with him in heaven for all eternity because he paid for your sins and he didn't want you to go to hell and do it yourself. I thank God so much that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to this sin-filled earth, and I'm one of them and told me that he loved me while I was a sinner and he would be willing to pay for my sins so I could live with him in heaven for all eternity. Nobody ever loved me like Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. And I'm going to believe some preacher lying to me and said, Oh, I'll forgive your sins. You lying sucker. I'm trusting Jesus Christ. So trusting him, he made me two promises. In Max Jones, if you'll believe, that Christ died for you, came to this earth, went to the cross, the hell of the cross, so you could leave this earth and go to heaven and bypass a literal hell. Then I'll make you two promises. Whosoever believeth in him, Christ, will never perish, but have everlasting life. So therefore, I know, and he wrote in verse John 5, 13, these things are written unto you here in the Bible, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, and the word know in the Greek is absolutely positively, without one question, without one doubt of any kind, because God would have to be a liar if you're not going to heaven. I've written these things to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I thank God that he put it in writing, so I don't have to live to listen to some church come up with a bunch of garbage that will take me right straight into hell, being religious. Aren't you glad Christ died for you? Let's just bound a word of prayer, okay? Well, their heads bound, their eyes closed. If you've never trusted Christ, and maybe everybody here has, and I sure hope so, but if you haven't, 
Well then, all you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he died on the cross, your whole time saved from it. And if you will just, if you want to do anything, just say, thank you, Lord. I believe. I believe you died for me. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven and live with you for all time and eternity. And you'll know that you have eternal life because God promised it to you. You may not jump up and grab a hold of the rafters of the church or anything else like that. That doesn't mean a thing. The thing it means is God promised you and never perish to have eternal life. Just simply believe it because your sins are paid for when you believe that Christ did it for you. It's that simple. That's how you, no matter how you cut it or slice it. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you. Thank you for each one of you this morning. Thank you for the things here that you put in the Bible that we can know. The majority of the world doesn't because they just don't believe in you and straight and narrows the way. There'll be few that find it. And we thank you so much that we can know we have a home in heaven in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Keep your eyes.